Driving at home with Avor's housing economist, Claire Losey. All right, guys, we're here for another week of Driving at Home with Avor's housing economist, Claire Losey. Good morning, Claire. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. So we have lots to talk about. Let's start with mortgage rates. We know that the Fed met last, last week. that They made a, an, in another hike in, in the interest rates overall. What are we seeing in response to that with regards to mortgage rates? Absolutely. So it will take a couple weeks for the effect of the most recent rate hike to percolate through the mortgage market. Last week, we actually saw a very slight decline in mortgage rates down to about 6.37%. Overall, we expect that the increase in the Fed funds rate actually probably won't really affect mortgage rates this cycle largely because the mortgage market had already anticipated this rate hike and had priced it into the mortgage rate prior to the Fed meeting. And so what, I mean, what is a traditional cadence of the Fed meets, they increase interest rates, and then what happens next to trigger up a response in the mortgage market? Absolutely. So the Federal Reserve's primary tool for achieving its dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment is the target for the federal funds rate. And that's the rate at which banks lend reserves to each other overnight. So in other words, it's a short-term interest rate. And by changing the federal funds rate, other interest rates can also be affected, like the 10-year Treasury yield, which is a long-term rate. So generally speaking, as the federal funds rate increases, investors' demand for long-term maturities, including those 10-year Treasury notes, declines. And so this pushes up the yield on the 10-year Treasury because investors' expectations for short-term interest rates over the life of a bond increase, and they need a higher yield in order to want to invest. And as the 10-year Treasury yield increases, this actually in turn causes mortgage interest rates to increase. There's a pretty significant positive correlation between the 10-year Treasury yield and mortgage rates. So So it's really a trickle down. The Fed meets and then there's some period of time as the the 10-year yield. Right, right. Got it. Right. There's not a direct correlation between the Fed funds rate and the mortgage rate. It's induced from the effect of the Fed funds rate on the 10-year Treasury yield. Got it. Got it. Well, you know, we've had obviously several bank failures at this point and consumers are feeling, you know, a little itchy with regards to to the funds available to them and just where their money is and, and the stability of the banking system overall. What are you seeing in terms of consumer savings and just what what the level of comfort that consumers have right now in the banking overall? Sure. So we know that the personal savings rate has declined over the past year plus now, and that's largely the result of higher inflation. And consumers walking into this period of higher inflation that we've seen really over the past two years now actually had pretty strong balance sheets. And to be clear, when we're talking about household balance sheets, we're referring to assets and liabilities and the difference between the two, which is net worth. So an example of an asset in a liability actually is owning a home. Generally speaking, it's an asset in the sense that homes appreciate in value and you're able to build equity, but it's a liability in the sense that most homeowners carry mortgage debt. And then, of course, it helps you to build net worth because as your home is appreciating in value, its asset relative to the liability is Um, increasing, right? Anyways, generally speaking, walking into this period of of higher inflation, household balance sheets were fairly robust, largely because of the strong fiscal stimulus that households received in the initial wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there was that excess savings accrued from the economic impact payments. And then, of course, the lockdowns, which reduced spending. However, we've seen that due to higher inflation, Households have largely had to spend down um, that excess savings that they accrued during the initial wake of the pandemic, especially those lower income households um, have had to have had to do that. So, in other words, persistently high inflation has eroded our ability to save and 
certainly has caused um, a disparate impact on lower income households. Yeah. And we care about that because we think about, you know, a consumer's flexibility with regards to the change in their buying power as a result of both inflated, you know, housing prices because the market has been so robust over the last few years and then now increased interest rates. It simply costs more you know, for them to buy. Right. Than to right. right. So cognizant of what their flexibility is from a financial standpoint. Absolutely. The effect is stronger for the effect of inflation is stronger for renters. Homeowners have been able to better weather the inflationary pressures, especially because they've seen such significant equity gains over the past several years. Yeah. The total net worth is is rising because of the increase in the value of the home. Right. Right. Got it. What are you seeing in the market this week? What's happening with pendings? Where are we at? Absolutely. So we saw a slight decline in sales on a weekly basis. And overall, we expect that our April housing stats, which will be released later this week, will probably show continued moderation in the housing market. We're expecting a fairly weak spring home buying season, relatively speaking. But overall, We have to remember that the Austin economy is well positioned to weather this inflationary storm and a potential recession due to our strong population and job growth. And when you speak to the spring not being as robust um, as it could be, (laughs) is that more in the context of a look back over the last couple of years of kind of chaotic and, and uber robust market coming out of COVID? Or is that in a normalized look back, you know, pre-COVID years even, do we see that that this is a typical selling season in that sense or just in regards to a direct look back to the last couple of years? That's a great question. I think even in a even in a relative to a normalized housing market, we're still seeing a little bit more of a slowdown. Mm-hmm. However, That being said, the median sales price in March was 36% higher than it was in March of 2020. So Mm -hmm. we're we're dealing with still elevated home prices. And that's partially why we're seeing a a weaker spring home buying season is because of the effect of those higher mortgage rates and on dampening demand for home ownership. And then, of course, you know, amid still elevated home prices, you know, that's kind of a double whammy, right? Right. When it comes to consumer demand for home ownership. And and as we're experiencing this kind of shift in the market, do you see too that inventory, I mean, where are we at on inventory, do you expect with the stats later this week? So we saw an uptick in inventory, a pretty significant uptick in inventory um, in March. We're at about three months, which we're trending towards a more normalized market in which the supply of homes is commensurate, more commensurate to meet the ensuing demand for home ownership. P- inventory probably won't change too much. We're still seeing constraints, particularly at the lower end of the market. You know, those lower priced homes are still selling very quickly. So, all in all, inventory probably won't shift too much. That's more of a gradual change. Got it. Awesome. Well, Claire, we'll be back next week with you. Can't wait to hear more about our monthly stats as those get released later this week, as you said. And um, agents hang in there. We know it's a a shifting market and one that requires a lot of uh, patience with your consumers and conversation with your clients. And we're here to support you through that. So appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. 